during the week, uh, as I was meant to be getting ready for all the Christmas services that we've got, I was scrolling Facebook instead, uh, and I came across the, uh, this post from the Meanwhile in Australia Facebook page. You've probably seen it, and if you follow us on social media, I shared it there. It said this, it's almost Christmas, and I've never felt less Christmassy in my life. And the post had 1.7 million, uh, the, the page had 1.7 million likes. The post itself got 13,000, uh, over 13,000 likes and heaps and heaps of comments. Comments like this. This is my first Christmas without any family. I used to love Christmas. Now I wish it would hurry up and F off. Ooh, I'm trying, but I'm not really feeling it either. I hate Christmas with a passion. I spend it alone. It's so lonely. Legit, everyone I speak to is feeling like this this year. Or this particularly long comment, which is particularly sad and sobering. I remember my childhood. Christmas Eve used to be so, so special. Family tradition of being over the road with my beloved grandparents on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Friends and neighbours in attendance. Old Nana Cross cherished Christmas with all her heart. She would do all the planning and cooking. The Christmas tree would be resplendent in all of its incandescent glory. Presents stacked around it. Music, laughter, life. Now when I go back to Lynx Avenue, Cabramatta, the old house over the road from where I used to live is dead. My beloved grandparents are dead, have been for the past 24 years. Gosh, the time's passed so, so quickly. Old friends who were there, neighbours, also dead. The sobering reality of my own mortality has set in. Another year gone. My fear of death and non-existence is tormenting me. As a child and young teenager, I never considered that everything ends. I'm not feeling particularly well or psychologically well today. The depression and fear are particularly active. Goodness me. I'm not sure I feel particularly Christmassy now, having reminded myself of the depressing comment feed on that post. Which, of course, I think for us begs the question, what is it that makes Christmas Christmassy? What's the point of Christmas? Why is Christmas special? What does it even mean to feel Christmassy? And as we see in that last comment, that the answer for many revolves around family and food and gifts. And I want to say, in a sense, if that's what being, uh, if that's what Christmas means to you, then in one sense you're kind of right. Christmas is, in fact. Maybe not so much about food, but certainly about a family and a gift. But if we want to feel Christmassy, regardless of our impending mortality, then we need to shift our focus from our families and our gifts, which will end, to the first Christmas family and the first Christmas gift and centre ourselves on that. For that is the way to true deep and lasting joy at Christmas. And so to that end, I want us to just take a moment as we consider the story from Luke's Gospel and take a look at the first Christmas family and the first Christmas gift. What we notice about the first Christmas family is that they, they don't have it all together. They're far from perfect. Let me read you from uh, chap Luke chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Joseph went up to, from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. The underlining current of all of that, they were unwed and pregnant in a conservative society where that was a big deal. Now, of course, we know that there was no immorality involved back in Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 26, the angel Gabriel has visited Mary and told her the good news. Do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever and his kingdom will never end. But you know, I reckon that was a hard sell. Uh, as people watched 
the Virgin Mary uh, look more and more pregnant as the months progressed. No, I promise you, an angel told me that God did this. People most certainly would have assumed that Mary and Joseph had broken the moral and customary laws of the day. They were looked down upon. Of that, there is no doubt. Also, though they are from the line of a king, they are not wealthy. We read that they have to go to Bethlehem from Nazareth because he, uh, Joseph uh, is from the line of David, but the Davidic kinship has long lost its power, prestige and authority in the land of Israel. Israel has been exiled and invaded and is occupied by the Romans. And so Joseph is not some wealthy, uh, uh, you know, king's relative. Rather, he is a displaced person whose wealth has been lost through generational war. And now he has to travel back there because the uh, the, 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 the governors who are ruling the land have told him that that is what he must do and worse, he's got to do that with his pregnant fiancée and when they arrive, they can't find anywhere to stay. And Jesus' life effectively begins as it would continue throughout his earthly ministry as an adult in that he is homeless. There's no room in the inn, we read in verses 6 and 7. When the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn a son, she wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And in fact, it gets worse for Jesus. It's not just like he's born in a manger and he, you know, eventually they sort themselves out, but not long after Jesus' birth, his family are forced to flee to Egypt, we read in Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus. Matthew 2, verses 13 and 14, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. So they got up, took the child and left for the Egypt. That's a surefire way to not feel Christmassy, isn't it? To have to run away from death. But here we have the first Christmas family and they don't seem to be filled with joy, laughter and presence. They look imperfect, look down upon, poor, homeless, having to be refugees, fleeing for, their, uh, for safety, and yet, of course, in amongst all of this, there is something deeply significant going on in the midst of all their seeming troubles, which is the first Christmas gift. Now, when you think first Christmas gift, perhaps your mind goes to gold, frankincense or myrrh. But actually, the first Christmas gift is Jesus, God's gift to humankind which we see in our reading, God announcing to the shepherds in uh, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. And the shepherds were living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The first Christmas gift, God gives the world a saviour. And the shepherds on hearing this news and experiencing the glory of God shining around the angels figure, well, we better go and check this gift out. Verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. God has given us a marvellous gift. In John's Gospel, John describes Jesus as a gift in a famous verse. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. At Christmas, God gives us his Son, the only one who grows up to live a perfect life in total trust and obedience to God. And through his life, his death and his resurrection, the gift of Jesus brings everlasting life to all who believe. You know, the funny thing about Christmas is lots of gifts are given and lots quickly forgotten. Sometimes the only memorable gifts are the ones that are shockers. My family still talks about the giant glass jar that I once got my brother because I thought it would be good for his uh, new coffee obsession. But it turns out it was a terrible idea because it wasn't airtight or something. And they literally rib me about it every probably one to two Christmases. I was talking to someone uh, only a few days ago who no longer buys gifts for his family, he just gives them cash because it's just easier, because they have what they need and they don't really want anything. Now, every now and again, we get a gift that we deeply treasure. But even then, often it's not so much the gift that we treasure, but it's who gave it to us or the memory associated with it. And of course, even the most precious of gifts, the most treasured, can be lost, can be stolen or misplaced. But the first Christmas gift is totally different. God's gift of Jesus given to us once for all time can never be taken away. Its meaning and significance is not subjective. God has given us Jesus and that gift keeps on giving, even and especially if we're not feeling particularly Christmassy. Uh, just a few days ago, I wasn't feeling particularly Christmassy. I was getting angry and upset and annoyed about an issue that I'd fi- found myself uh, in the middle of. Uh, I felt like I was, it, the whole thing had become unjust. Uh, I was annoyed, I was angry, I was overwhelmed. And in the midst of this, as I was preparing uh, our sermon series for the coming few months here at the church, I was reading through John's Gospel and I read these words from John 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I have come overcome the world. They're the words of the baby Jesus when he grew up. He's speaking to his disciples. And he's telling us the beauty of Christmas. Beauty of Christmas is God has entered into our world and changed everything. The first Christmas family, in its scandal, in its imperfections, in its poverty, in its homelessness, was in the presence of God who has overcome the world. And when the shepherds come to see Jesus and talk about all the amazing things they've been told about him, What does Mary do in the dank stable, having just given birth, feeling awful, no doubt, but, you know, I'm sure the hormones were kicking in a little, but nonetheless, she'd be worried. How are we going to feed this baby? Where are we going to go? What's happening next? As the shepherds visit, as they tell her of the marvellous news that God has told her, as she remembers what the angels have told her some nine months ago, Verse 19, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. She takes to heart the truth about Jesus, the reality that she knows the saviour of the world. And that reality transcends the difficulty of her present circumstances. The Christmas story, the Christmas family, the Christmas gift, reminds us that no matter who we are, no matter what our circumstances, we are not forgotten. God has come to bring us peace and to overcome the world. All the pain, all the suffering, all the sadness, 
all the things that make us feel unchristmassy. Jesus proves God's love for me and for you, for Mary, for Joseph, for the shepherds. Jesus is a gift for all of us. And he's a gift that gives the most to us when we're in the deepest of pits, for he has overcome the world. Now, I don't know how you've turned up to church today. I don't know what your week, month or year has been like. But if you're not feeling very Christmassy, maybe approaching your first Christmas without loved ones, maybe you're feeling the pinch of increasingly difficult financial times and you haven't been able to put on the spread you might normally have. Maybe you're in the midst of a difficult situation that feels unfair or unjust or whatever else it might be that's getting you down. Christmas reminds you that God is for you and that in Jesus he has come near to you. God knows you He loves you and he sent Jesus to save you. And that truth can transcend the worst of circumstances. Feeling Christmassy isn't about life being good, but about God being good by sending Jesus to us. And for those of us who've come today full of joy, You're looking forward to me uh, finishing talking so that you can get home and get on with the good parts of the day. You've got the family together for the first time in a while. You've opened a great present this morning that you want to go back and play with. And I'm talking about the adults. Let me encourage you, don't let these things be what makes you feel the joy of Christmassy. As you do all those good things, feel Christmassy because they remind you and they point you to the good gifts that God has given us and the greatest gift of all, his son. What makes Christmas feel Christmassy? Jesus. And my prayer for all of you today is that you would get to know him better. And once all the festivities are over, If you're interested in finding out more, if you want to work out how to make sense of the difficult things of life, let me encourage you. We're here every Sunday and we're on later normally so you can sleep in, 10 o'clock. We're also running a course later uh, later next year in February called Alpha, which is a chance to get together and in an open forum discuss Questions about life and faith and Jesus. Jesus is the reason for the season. And as you trust him, may you feel the deep Christmassy joy that God has for you. Amen. Amen.